So it's, it's really our huge pleasure to, um, to welcome um, uh, Liz Thompson from the Vermont Land Trust and Eric Sorensen and Bob Dano from the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife to come here and uh, celebrate the launch of this, this, this new edition of Wetland Woodland Wildland together. Um, as a naturalist and educator here and as a student of natural resources in Vermont, um, this book has been uh, just instrumental in me understanding uh, the place in which in which I grew up, and I was actually just upstairs scrounging around trying to find my copy of Wetland Woodland Wildland, and realized that it is stuffed where it belongs, which is in my field backpack next to my shovels and hand lenses and binoculars and all that good stuff. So I am proud to say that I can't find it. It means, it, it means it's where it's supposed to be right now, which is in my car with all my other field gear, which is where yours should be too. Um, so. Um, yeah, this, this book has, it, it really does something very special, and it's, it's appropriate that this special thing uh, exists to describe the natural resources here in Vermont. Um, it not only is a uh, fantastic window into the different um, pieces that make up the landscape around us, this tree and that bird and, and that flower, but especially the patterns and the processes and how it all fits together, and, and, and what it means when you walk into this particular wood, uh, set of woods and why it feels this particular way. Um, so without um, overstepping all the things that they're gonna talk about, um, I also want to mention that Bear Pond Books is here um, as co-host of this, this whole thing, and uh, they'll be available selling books now and to talk, and Liz and Eric and Bob will be available to, to sign your treasured copies after the, the talk tonight as well. I um, also want to uh, thank the uh, Hardy Plant Club of Northern Vermont for um, helping uh, promote this and co-host this and advertise this uh, with us as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, help me uh, welcome and celebrate um, Bob, Liz, Eric, and the new edition of Wetland, Woodland, Wildland. Uh, of the three of us, and also the, 
the, these three organizations, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, Vermont Land Trust, and the Nature Conservancy, who have all been involved in this work over the years. Really important um, to, to just know that. Uh, so what's a natural, actually when we gave this talk in Burlington a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, partway through, Eric said, hey, can you say what a natural community is? So this time I put a slide in. Thank you. <laughs> A natural community is an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, and the natural processes that affect them. It's how we define it. Um, and this is actually a picture that was in the first edition of the book, or maybe on the cover. Um, so, we're, I want to talk about some of the things that are new in this edition of the book, but the most important thing that's new is that Bob Zeno has joined us as an equal partner in this work. And that picture was not taken in Vermont, right? No. <laughs> Somewhere in Minnesota, is that right? Um, and Bob has been just incredibly uh, helpful and important in, in this work and in, in this updating this new edition of the book. He's been uh, graduated from the Field Naturalist Program and has been doing this kind of work, uh, mapping natural communities for the state of Vermont for the last 10 years. And so he's gained a wealth of knowledge, knows a lot more about it than I do, and um, is just a really great partner in this. And, uh, he is also, by the way, our succession plan. So <laughs> we look forward to, to seeing how Bob carries this work forward um, in the years to come and, um, and engaging all, all of the collaborators that have helped us in this work. Speaking of collaborators, you know, there's the three of us, but there's, this, this is really the work of many, many people. And these are really just a few of them. Um, there's just lots of people, some of whom are here in this room, who, who really helped us advance this work over the last uh, number of years. And so this was a group of people who met uh, two summers ago to study a particular natural community that I'll, I'll be talking about in a minute. So here's a list of what's new. There's 17 new natural communities. There's one which and each of us will talk about at least one of those. There's uh, one new biophysical region, Eric will talk about that. There's more emphasis on climate change and conservation. New information on wildlife habitat mostly assembled by Eric, and he'll talk about that. We have new geology maps uh, and lots of new photos, which we are we're most, most of them taken by friends and colleagues of ours, some of, of, ours, some of you are here, and um, we're proud of that. And, uh, each of the community's profiles has been enhanced and, and really edited in, in depth. So going back to Bob for a second, one of the most important things that Bob did in this process was he asked a lot of questions. And his favorite question to ask, we'd be sitting around like we'll, we'll sit, the three of us have countless meetings. I mean, <coughs> endless, there were one, fun, fun, fun meetings and wonderful, but there were a lot of them. But Bob's favorite thing was to say, he'd read something, you know, we'd have the text up on the wall and he'd read something from the first edition, he'd say, is that really true? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it was, and sometimes it wasn't. So he actually revealed some errors in the first edition. <laughs> um, so we appreciate that. that. Um, so that's, you know, so we really did edit hard in that, so everything is really, really uh, quite enhanced now. So um, this little diagram is not new. Uh, it was in the old edition of the book, but in the new edition of the book, this is a, uh, sorry about that. This is one of Bob's brilliant ideas. We put it on the back page of the book so you can quickly get to it. It's a, and so it's just a quick guide um, to the natural communities of Vermont and, and the groups of natural communities. So it, we, it divides into upland natural communities and wetland natural communities. In the uplands, we have forest and woodlands, open uplands, and then the wetlands, similar, forested and open, and then three to four types within each of those categories. So I'm going to talk about northern hardwood forests. So in, within the upland forests and woodlands, we have three what we call formations. Um, and I'm going to start with the northern hardwood forest formation. So this is a group of seven natural community types that are northern hardwood dominated but have slight differences. Um, and so, for example, the northern hardwood forest. Oh, here's something else that's new in this edition, that um, some of the illustrations are, um, are now colored, and which they were all black and white at first. And here's something else I have to remember to say. And this is this is like the, the super important. Not only do we have these wonderful illustrations, but the design of the book, the way it's all laid out, 
is the work of Linda Mirabile. And Linda's right here, and I, it's just, just <laughs> amazing. <laughs> an absolute pleasure to work with all the way through and she she was very patient with us <laughs> because it was a long process much longer than we expected initially um, but it's just just uh, wonderful design work um, so the northern hardwood forest is the most common natural community in Vermont it is what we call a matrix uh, natural community meaning that it covers uh, it, it covers the majority of mid, mid elevation uh, forest in Vermont and this is a northern hardwood forest greening up in the spring. And we, you can see in this photo, you can see uh, where the sugar maple is. Those are the, the um, green, greening up trees. And the red maples are more up on the ridges. They, they leaf out a little bit later. So, and so it's a, it's a, the idea is that it's, it, northern hardwood forest occupies most of this image. But in places, is there a pointer on this thing? <laughs> oh, that, yeah, so you see the, the uh, sugar maple here, but, but it's sort of pockmarked by these other things, by either hemlock ridges or spruce ridges, something like that. I don't know exactly what they are in this, in this photo. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the most common natural community in Vermont, but I'm going to, my colleagues were generous enough to let me talk about rich places, places that are enriched. And we um, are really, we're really pleased with this new ge geological map. It's a, um, a, a map that, we had a version of this in the first edition of the book, um, but thanks to Gus Goodwin, who's here, thanks Gus, and Dan Farrell and uh, Margie Gale, we've got this new ecological classification of Vermont bedrock. And anything that's in blue on this is calcareous. So the whole Champlain Valley and western part of the state and much of the eastern part of the state. And the browns are generally not calcareous. So we ecologists and botanists, we tend to gravitate to the blue places <laughs> because they're just, just have more diversity. Um, and in the, uh, in the process of, of uh, doing this work over the years, we've, we've come to realize that Vermont has a disproportionately large amount of calcareous bedrock, and so we feel that we have sort of a responsibility to, to conserve it. Um, so still in the northern hardwood forest formation, um, I'm going to talk just briefly about rich northern hardwood forests, which are one of my favorite natural communities. This is Bob Zeno's slide. Uh, beautiful place with big trees, in this, in this case trees grow really quickly in these places and, and well. Um, rich northern hardwood forest is a place where, where often, it's often at the base of the slope, like a cove where, where soil accumulates at the base of the slope. And this is a class that um, Kathy Paris and I teach at the University of Vermont. And on the first day of the class, we go to a kind of a standard northern hardwood forest. And on the second day of the class, we go to a rich northern hardwood forest. And so we make them safe with the good stuff for the second day. Um, but you can see in this, in this photo, there's a wood nettle, um, some goldie spurn in the background, which is a plant that grows in rich northern hardwood forests. But these are the students digging a soil pit and studying the soils in rich northern hardwood. Blue cohosh is one of the plants that occurs in rich northern hardwood forest. And here, this is an illustration by Betsy Brigham, whose illustrations, many, many of whom, uh, whose illustrations are in the book. They're lovely illustrations. Uh, large flowered bellwort, one of my favorite sedges, uh, wide leaf or plantain leaf sedge, maiden hair fern, and uh, tooth work. And this is something that I learned in the course of doing this book, which I didn't know before, but Eric taught this to us. Or you learned else. it, huh? I learned it from somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this um, West Virginia white is a butterfly that is, is obligate on toothwort. It's now, in this picture, it's sitting on another plant. Um, <laughs> huh? Dicentra. <laughs> um, I don't know which one. But anyway, it's obligate on, on toothwork for part of its life cycle, so that's pretty cool. 
Okay, uh, now in the warmer climate areas of Vermont, the oak pine, northern hardwood forest formation. Again, some of my favorites, limestone bluff cedar pine forest, just hugging the shores of, of Lake, the bluffs on Lake Champlain. Beautiful places, who can't love these places? And it's just amazing how the trees kind of cling to the rocks. And these trees can get to be quite old. You've, you've found trees more than 300 years old, right? Uh, these cedar, northern white cedar trees, just amazing. <coughs> Some of the typical plants made in here, spleenwort, liver honeysuckle, and my actual favorite sedge, uh, Carex ebernia, which is, um, some people call it ebony sedge, but more other people call it pine tree sedge, because that's what ebernia actually means. Um, and, the, and there's a lot of rare and uncommon plants uh, associated with this natural community. And for each of the uh, natural communities, we have lists like this, rare and uncommon plants, rare and uncommon animals in addition to commonly associated plants and animals. Ram's head lady slipper, there's a best good with photo, beautiful photo, is one of the plants found in these, uh, in these places. This is just a range map of northern white cedar, and the reason I'm showing this is because northern white cedar actually does occur way down, people don't think of it as occurring way, that far south. We think of ourselves as being at the southern end of its range, um, and that's not quite true. Um, it does occur in the, in the southern Appalachians in, in places that are like our limestone bluff cedar pine forests and like gullies and rocky places. And it makes me think, I, I don't know why I'm jumping to this, but it makes us think that possibly, you know, this, these are like refugia and maybe our limestone bluff cedar pine forests are going to be refugia as the climate warms that, that northern white cedar might still cling to those places and be able to, to survive there as it does, as it does here. Um, dry oak maple limestone forest is a community that often occurs landward of the limestone bluff cedar pine forest. And this is a new natural community in this edition. It was a subtype before. So it's a new natural community. And um, I had the pleasure of sitting in the woods at the Cat Bay State Park with Libby Davidson while she um, drafted this illustration. It's really fun to do. So, so I'm there with my laptop, like writing the natural community <laughs> description while she's doing something quite a bit more artistic. Some of the plants that occur here, bloodroot, hepatica, early meadow rue, uh, leatherwood, and uh, bubblet bladder fern. And this is another cool thing I learned about. Does anybody know what this thing is? The American giant millipede. And this is a species that occurs in calcareous areas. This was this photo was taken in the Cape Bay State Park. And these things um, take up uh, take up calcium from their environment and incorporate it into their exoskeletons to protect them from desiccation and um, and predation. So it's kind of cool. Okay, now uh, I've got two minutes, so I'm going to go to <coughs> swamps. And this is a new natural community as well. So this is that same group of people that I showed at the beginning. This is what they were doing that day. They were looking at seepage forests and trying to, you know, trying to share information and just trying to trying to better understand seepage forests. So in this in, in this in that photo at the beginning, Hannah Phillips was one of the people in the photo, and I want to really acknowledge her work um, in helping us to. She she did a project um, for the Vermont Land Trust. Uh, on the Atlas Timberlands and forest land that we have in northern Vermont. And in that project, in, in throughout that process, really learned a lot. And Gus also, others uh, contributed to this, but Hannah really sort of gave us the raw materials with which to write the description of northern part of the Forest. So thank you. These forests can be kind of closed canopy forests, or they can be quite open like this. And they have uh, wet soils. And this is actually, just look look hard at this for a second. It's actually video. <laughs> you see the water coming out? Yeah. So this is this is a, a organic soil over hard pan, and the, the water is, is sitting on top of the hard pan. And when Hannah, this is, was a, a soil pit that Hannah dug, um, you can actually see the um, see the water coming out. Uh, trees are shallow rooted. Um, these are important areas for black bears because they green up first in the spring. Um, some of the plants, and I'm just going to just I'm gonna 
skip over this. And this is just the final thing. It's just one little fun story about um, some inventory. Uh, Eric and Bob will both talk more about inventory and the process of natural communities <coughs> inventory. But we learned, uh, in 1985, I was driving around with Peter Zika, who was a botanist. And he, we had known that, that there was an occurrence, a record of this rare plant, sticky false asphodel, on the White River in Sharon. And we didn't know where, but we're driving down Route 14. And we look across the river, and there's this kind of cool looking place. So we put on our bathing suits and we swim. <laughs> <laughs> we crawled up on the bank, and lo and behold, we found <laughs> this very rare plastic false asphodel. And uh, along with some other things, uh, Calm's lobelia, rare Garfer's sedge, uh, rare capillary beak brush, and this is classified as a wet shore, one of our rarest natural communities, Calcareous Riverside Sea. And now I'm going to turn it over to Bob. All right. Sorry, you put it in. Do I now? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. It's um, it, it's a real privilege to be up here uh, as co-author of book and, and speaking with Liz and Eric. It's a little intimidating. Uh, I think Liz was very generous in her description of when I asked, you know, is that true? Uh, she's neglecting to mention all the times that I asked, is that true? And it turns out there's a lot of things about ecology that I thought I knew uh, and didn't actually know and really got that all straightened out uh, during the course of writing this book. Um, I want to talk, I want to take us, I guess, to a little different uh, theme here and go to some cold places, which fits with today. Uh, this is not Vermont. This is the boreal forest up in Canada. Uh, the boreal forest is an area that's always kind of intrigued me. It's, uh, I think, the world's largest ecosystem, uh, although I may be mistaken about that. But it's, it's circumpolar. You can see it on that map. And you can see this um, star down here is Vermont. And Vermont is not in the boreal forest <laughs> ecosystem. But we have natural communities that have uh, a really strong affinity to these northern places. And I think it's really neat to see the parallels. And I wanted to show you some of the parallels between things we have here uh, very close by that uh, are really strongly connected to these more remote regions. And I wanted to start uh, keeping with this theme of calcium-rich places and talk about boreal calcareous cliffs. So on our chart here, we're uh, in upland natural communities, and open uplands, and uh, out there in cliffs and talus. So there's other types of cliffs and talus communities in Vermont, and this is just one. Uh, these communities are, or this community is mostly found in the northeastern part of the state. Uh, a lot of it is on that blue part of the map that Liz was showing, but not all of it. Uh, some of it is in areas where we don't think of the rock as being particularly rich in calcium. And the place I want to talk about, there's a lot of nice examples of boreal calcareous cliffs, places like Lake Willoughby, uh, but I want to talk about my favorite, which is in Smuggler's Notch. And I'm guessing many of you have been to Smuggler's Notch or know Smuggler's Notch. Uh, it's this steep walled mountain pass. And the cliffs, you can, you can be on the road and you can look up and you can see that there's lots of exposed rock in these uh, big cliffs. And when you get up close, they look uh, like this and you can see water dripping off the cliffs. There are thin bands of calcium-rich rock in these cliffs. And because there's so much rain and snow and fog, and the cliffs are often wet and dripping and seepy, that calcium gets uh, moved over the cliff face. And you get plants growing on these cliffs that uh, really don't grow anywhere else in Vermont. Uh, species like uh, butterwort, which is carnivorous, you can see some uh, uh, legs in there, I think. <laughs> uh, purple Mountain Saxifrage. This photo is by Matt Peters, who's here. White Mountain Saxifrage, which is uh, a mountain saxifrage. Uh, it's not named after the White Mountains in New Hampshire. It's just a white mountain saxifrage. <laughs> Liz had a, she went through it quickly, but this is a species that also grows in those uh, riverside seeps, but you can find it up in the mountains, uh, clinging to the sides of cliffs. Uh, so uh, showing how that calcium can really uh, bring plants to different places. 
fragrant fern. This is a plant that grows uh, in Vermont only in uh, shaded overhangs where calcium seeps out of a crack in the cliff. So talk about being very specific in habitat. A uh, pale painted cup, a relative of the Western Indian paintbrush. And then this is not a plant, but I think it is <laughs> not to point out peregrine falcon, which I think is one of the most charismatic uh, critters of boreal calcareous cliffs. Uh, he's soaring high above smuggler's notch. So getting in to find these uh, species is not like going to most natural communities. It's uh, a little different. Uh, and I've been lucky over the past few years in my free time and uh, a little bit for my work to get to go to these, uh, to these places and see this. Just, uh, we know about many of the species that are in these cliffs. They've, been, uh, they've attracted botanists for many years, I think uh, going back to the previous uh, two centuries. But most people don't get up on cliffs like this. And, when we do, we find that these plants are much more abundant and widespread maybe than I think people really realized. And it's neat to see that they're, they're all over these rock faces in these hard to access places where they're really mostly free from human disturbance except for those crazy people up there on ropes. Uh, you know, I think that inventory matters. Uh, in my work with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, I'm out on lands owned by uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department by Forest Parks and Recreation out on our uh, state parks and state forests, uh, doing inventory of natural communities to help ensure that the management of these lands is considering all these many different species that are out there and that we can uh, use and enjoy the landscape and also protect uh, all the plants and animals that are out there in all of the different natural communities. Uh, that's about 20 to 40,000 different species, by the way. <laughs> we can't talk about cold, boreal affinity communities without thinking about winter. And winter is pretty harsh on boreal calcareous cliffs. Uh, you can, I think that kind of speaks for itself. <laughs> uh, the species have some surprising adaptations. So this is that white mountain saxifrage again. And you can see these little white dots on the leaf edge. Those are calcium crystals, so it's taking that calcium out of the rock in the water and uh, exuding it on the leaf edges. And those dots, uh, there's recent research showing that those dots actually help uh, focus the light coming in, limited light that these plants get because they're often in, you know, they're shaded on cliffs or little crevices, and it helps uh, improve its efficiency of photosynthesis. I don't claim to understand any. Uh, physics of all that, but it's a pretty <laughs> amazing adaptation, I think. And this plant will also photosynthesize any time in winter that the temperature is up above freezing and there's uh, sunlight. So like in this photo, I bet it was photosynthesizing. And that little extra bit of energy uh, is maybe what helps these plants persist in these tough places. Talking about connections to the north, these species you can go uh, hundreds of miles north into the boreal forest, find a cliff like this, and it's almost entirely the same species. So we have uh, little pieces of that right here. Surrounding uh, boreal calcareous cliffs is often a community that's much more familiar to people, the montane spruce fir forest. Uh, on the chart, we're back up in the upland forest and woodlands, and spruce fir northern hardwood. You probably uh, might, be, you might be familiar with these uh, red spruce, balsam fir, uh, lush, mossy places, uh, including uh, species like this, night's bloom moss. Forests that are exposed to wind, uh, and wind throw is a common natural disturbance. So here's a little patch of a forest that's regenerating after disturbance. And you can see, uh, or hear, some really neat birds up there, like the black bird green warbler, or the thick nails thrush, which only lives in, on mountaintops in uh, New York, New England, and adjacent Canada. Working our way up, the Alpine Zone is a place that has attracted people for a long time. I found this photo uh, from a 
photo <laughs> painting <laughs> from 1858. Uh, this is the ridge on Mount Mansfield. That's the chin. It's a little uh, uh, dramatic. <laughs> Libby Davidson actually has almost exactly the same perspective on Mount Mansfield for one of her community drawings, showing subalpine crumpets and alpine meadow, uh, just with a little more realism to it, which I think doesn't take away any of the drama of this amazing place. So those are two communities in the alpine zone, but I want to talk about the third alpine community, which is the alpine peatlands, which is uh, very, very small pockets in the alpine zone that most people probably uh, don't pay a lot of attention to. So we're in a wetland uh, community now, open and shrub wetlands and open peatlands. Peatlands are wetlands with uh, deep soils of organic material. In the alpine zone, those soils aren't actually that deep, but they accumulate there. These communities can be really wet and fen-like with water moving through the ground. You can see that in this photo. Or they can be uh, bog-like uh, and it's a little hard to tell here, but this is actually a bog on a ridge of bedrock right on top of the Mount Mansfield Ridge. And uh, nutrients can't really get to the center of that, so these plants are living in a very nutrient-poor environment, and it's uh, spongy and uh, would be almost dry if you were to walk right through the middle of it, which you shouldn't do in the outline zone. <laughs> you can look close to these places and find evidence of the the different plants and sphagnum mosses, and uh, one of the animals that's up there, snowshoe hare. And then drawing this back to the north again, alpine peatlands make up just tiny little pockets in our alpine zone. Uh, square feet is how we would measure the area we have in Vermont. Uh, finding something the size of this room would be uh, I don't even know if there is any wetland up there as big as this room. If you go further north, uh, alpine peatlands are actually the, the matrix natural community in places. And you can walk for uh, long distances with your feet just getting wet uh, constantly. And it looks like, like this here. And dry alpine zone is, is unusual. So we have these, these little pockets, again, that uh, connect to these further north places. And maybe just a note here, you know, we're at the southern edge of the range of these things, and uh, it's worrying to think about what climate change means for these places that are, uh, you know, in our coldest and harshest environments. And if we, if the climate continues to change and we have warmer uh, conditions, will we still have these connections to these places? And will we still have those uh, special species here? I think it's an open question what's going to happen, but uh, it's troubling. The last community that I want to talk about is one of the new natural communities. These aren't new in that like they've appeared. <laughs> uh, you know, we just didn't recognize them fully. And uh, boreal floodplain forest occurs only in the uh, the northeast part of the state. This actually probably exaggerates uh, the range of this community. I think it's mostly up in the, the cold basins, up in the, uh, like the Nolhegan Basin, uh, some of the rivers that flow north into Lake Memphis Magog, and maybe a little bit down into uh, Calais and uh, maybe into the Groton area. Floodplains are, are wetland natural communities, and they're forested, so we're in the floodplain forests section of the book. Uh, most of the floodplains in Vermont are uh, tall sugar maple, uh, silver maple trees, uh, open canopy, uh, fern understory, or sorry, open midstory and fern understory. But this boreal community is really different. It can be dense uh, spruce, it can be white spruce, balsam fir, uh, black ash, northern white cedar, a really uh, neat mix of trees that we don't often see together. And then there's uh, shrubby and uh, grassy areas along the river that I think are there because of ice scour every year. And so trees can't get established. And here's just another shot. This is a very dark picture of the Melhegan River. But you can see that uh, those open areas there. 
Uh, American Elm was probably part of this community too, but we've, we've lost most of those times to Dutch Elm disease. There's efforts to reintroduce that species back into our floodplains in Vermont. Uh, some other species in these places are speckled alder, uh, wood turtles, um, maybe if you're lucky, boreal birds like the uh, Canada jay or gray jay. They just changed the name to Canada jay. So I'll leave you with one final picture of the north. Uh, this is uh, Labrador, mm -hmm. and maybe the species start to be a little different uh, up there, but you can see that it's the same pattern. It's those uh, conifer-dominated uh, forests along the river and the ice scour zone in the foreground here. And it's the same processes and patterns right here in our state that connect to that northern landscape. So maybe you're not as uh, enthusiastic about these northern places as I am, but I think it's neat to, to take our communities and think about what we can find in them and learn from them, not just about here, but uh, two other places you might go out there. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Still there, still awake. <laughs> um, I just want to say how good it is to be here too and uh, how uh, proud I am to have worked with uh, Bob and Liz on this. Um, I want to tell one more story about Liz and inventory before I, I put up a picture. Um, uh, this is the place I was talking about. It was another swimming store of, of Liz. This was quite a while ago and I wasn't there, but I've heard tell about it a couple times. Uh, Island Pond, people been to Island Pond? There's a, an island in Island Pond, you might picture that, um, and it has uh, red pine on it. And uh, I think this worked out that uh, Liz saw the red pine out there. This was probably in the 80s sometimes, and said, I've got to get there. And so she just swam up. So <laughs> there are different ways of getting a bar. Um, so uh, I'm going to cover a few things. Again, it's great to work with Liz and Bob and with Linda on this. I just wanted to say again how much we appreciate Linda's uh, sort of dedication to getting this book in beautiful form. Um, so I'm going to talk about oaky forests. Uh, I want to talk about the new uh, um, biophysical region. Again, new in the sense that we just recognized it's there. Uh, I want to talk about animals and how we fit them into the book more, uh, and about two types of swamps and how we decided to split things, uh, just some examples of how we split things. So uh, first, um, I'm going to talk about the oak pine forests uh, up in that part of the, the classification. And um, this is just a picture of uh, Ball Mountain Dam on the West River. People been on the West River? It's a beautiful, beautiful river. And in these photos taken in October, uh, uh, the oak still haven't lost their leaves. So if you fly that time of year, you can pick out the oaks perfectly. And the only other thing that, sh that holds its leaves like that are young beech that can that sort of confuse things. But uh, flying around is part of, part of uh, looking at inventories like this. But um, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why we do those inventories. And um, so I've been with the Fish and Wildlife Department for, I can't remember, 20 some years. And most of my work has been conducting inventories around the state. And those inventories are of generally of natural community groups. And the idea is if we can go out and look at a whole group or a set of, say, softwood swamps or cedar swamps or montane forests, we can get a better sense of how the individual types fit together. And we can work on classification. We can work on sorting out uh, how the classification works. But we can also find best examples. Um, here's Brett Engstrom and, and uh, Ian Worley. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time in Ian's plane for this inventory and others. And what we do is we identify sites, all the red dots on here, places we want to get to, and then the color uh, loop-de-loops are uh, places that we flew uh, to take a look at the sites that we selected to see which ones are good. I have to say, I have these uh, uh, sort of positive, negative views of Ian's plane. Um, I, I, I picture it, and I can picture the red leather inside and the smell of aviation fuel and all the great notes I took and pictures I took, but also getting 
totally green from doing these, <laughs> these loop de loops all over. This was actually a pretty uh, easy inventory, this oak inventory, because they're, they're big places. Uh, we also did inventories on things like fens, and they're tiny places, and you see one, and Ian will, Ian will go, ah, oh, there's one, and we zoom down and do <laughs> multiple loops around. So anyway, great time, good memories, and a little green. <laughs> Uh, probably the best part of my job, I haven't done much in the last few years, is I have to go to places like this. This is uh, North, North Pollock Hills, um, and if you haven't been there, the Nature Conservancy has a wonderful preserve there, and there's another uh, preserve at Haystack Mountain. Um, just an incredible place with all different kinds of oak forests and oak, natural oak things like this. This is with uh, Bob Zeno and Bob Pop and uh, Charlie Home. But, um, the part of the inventory that this is, is getting on the field, collecting information, uh, collecting information so we can map the, uh, map the area and document the plants and animals there. So uh, in those oak forests, I just want to run through a few of what those, are, what those are like and how the inventory works. This is a dry oak hickory half hornbeam forest. It has this cool savanna-like character, an understory of uh, woodland sedge, Carex pensilvanica. Um, and oaks and hickories and sometimes some white pine. But it looks like this some places, and it looks like this other places. And you might say, well, it's a different community. But if you, if you look at the characteristic species, they're all there, and it takes different forms. So it's being able to see many examples of these that gives us the ability to say, this is one type. Um, then there are other types like this. This is a photo of uh, Bob Hops of uh, some of the communities that we need to manage to keep them in a, a state like this. This is a, a, a prescribed burn in Colchester. Um, I want to spend a few minutes on this community, Dry Red Oak White Pine Forest, which is a new one in this edition, and probably one of my favorites. Uh, a favorite partly because it's really simple. It doesn't have many species in it. Uh, it's also a place where Red Oak sort of reaches its northern extent in Vermont. If you drive along I-89, and look north, all those little knobs where you see rock and trees, that's this community. And it tends to be in river valleys as you go north and on these southern exposures on hills. And it's red oak and white pine. Um, some places like this at Jamaica State Park down on the West River, it's almost all white pine. But there are always places, uh, bits of bedrock outcrop like that. Or some places it's almost more open. A place that I think will change maybe dramatically with climate change. One of the uh, climate change uh, features we expect is uh, more, more precipitation, but also extended droughts in the summer. And if you have a three-week drought in the summer or a four-week drought, it can be enough to change, uh, to expand these open areas and kill more of the trees, so expanding the openings. They have uh, sometimes soil like this, often very shallow soil over bedrock. And just some common plants there, maple leaf viburnum. Uh, this right, right. Right, thank you. Um, uh, blue stem goldenrod, blue sweet blueberry, uh, and pink uh, lady slipper. And in, in, in many uh, pine, pine forests, or forests with tall pines, uh, species like this, pine warbler, an early, an early migrant. I wanted to say something about Libby. This is Libby um, uh, at a site down in um, uh, south, southeastern Vermont. I forget where we were, actually. Uh, but she's in the middle of a swamp. And like Liz said, uh, when she was typing on her laptop, we just brought Libby to these places. And she would start off by taking a few pictures and then do some sketches in her notebook. An early sketch might look like this. Um, the, the next sketch with my rude notes all over it saying <laughs> what, what, what was wrong or what I thought could change, uh, and how she developed it into a part of the community. And you know, a lot of that was, well, can you add another tree here? Can you change this? Can you put a down log here? And then she'd come up with a final illustration of this. And what's cool about this is if you take a picture, you never get everything you want. But if you've got an illustrator, you can make it just the way you want it to be. <laughs> Um, these are the biophysical regions, and I just wanted to say a little bit about this new biophysical region, Champlain Hills, um, there on the top. And 
it, as you can see, it's a, it's a, it was broken out from the Champlain Valley and the Northern Green Mountains, and it's an intermediary between those two. Uh, it's, uh, this is an, a, an illustration by, by Libby, but uh, most of the illustrations on biophysical regions in the book are by, by Darian McElwain. Um, it's a place with lots of hills, low hills, three major rivers going through it, um, the Missisquoi, the Lamoille, and the Winooski. Uh, lots of dissected valleys like that. Um, it's a place where it is cooler than the Champlain Valley, uh, warmer than the Green Mountains, and also intermediate in terms of rainfall. We have uh, up to 79, 80 inches of precipitation in the Green Mountains, and more like 30 in the, in the Champlain Valley. But the, the westerly winds flowing across uh, the hills, uh, as they rise, they cool, and they drop moisture. So the, the Champlain Hills has somewhere around 40 inches of precipitation per year. Um, places like this, Armstrong Hill and Fletcher, the dominant forest is northern hardwood forest, but you can see patches of hemlock. And uh, again, these are one of my oak, oak photos, so a little, little bits of oak, but very little up there. And this hill, I'm going to forget what it's called now, um, uh, along the Lamoille River, uh, but also, again, a place with hemlock, um, mostly in a little bit of, a little bit of oak. At the northern end of this biophysical region, there are a lot of peatlands, like this uh, Franklin Bog, which is a, a preserve uh, owned by the Nature Conservancy, a, a really nice example of a poor thing. Um, just the, I think the last thing I want to talk about in terms of communities are, are, are some of the swamps and how we've gone about uh, refining those over, over time. In 2000, we had a, a, a community called uh, red maple black ash swamp. That was it. And it included any, any hardwood swamp with those species in it. Uh, with the new addition, and actually this happened as a result of those inventories that we've carried out, we've split that into these two types, one that's a, a seepage swamp and one that's a basin swamp. And that's a, a, a pattern that we've seen uh, repeatedly through inventory work and it's aligned with what, what all the other North New England states have done. Uh, when you have groundwater seepage coming out into the edge of a wetland, it enriches uh, the flora, uh, provides uh, calcium mostly for a much greater species diversity uh, as compared to these basin swamps, which tend to be small watersheds, often don't even have an inlet or outlet stream. And they can have deep peat, but they're uh, they're much poorer in species. So of those, here's a red maple black ash seepage swamp. Um, big black ash, that's one of the larger black ash I know, probably diameter like that. Black ash are one of the ones that are most in trouble with their emerald ash for, it sounds like. Uh, green ash too, white ash, they're st starting to see resistance now, which is encouraging. So seepage on the, on the forest floor, often water just kind of flowing through. Uh, species like this that are indicators of enrichment, um, swamp saxifrage, and this moss, which is, uh, I always like the name, I always try to convince my wife to call our kids Riggy Diadelphus. <laughs> but she never went for it. Uh, it's called shaggy moss. Um, hemlock swamp, uh, in 2000, described all those swamps that are dominated by hemlock. We split those again into seepage swamps and basin swamps. Here's the uh, basin swamp. This is one down in Wells. Uh, it's just uh, almost a pure carpet of several different species of sphagnum. Uh, Carex trisperma, uh, three-seeded sedge, which is kind of a, a swamp and, and uh, poor of forest species. I want to stop and talk about uh, wildlife and animals. This was sort of a big deal uh, to the changes in the book. And Liz made it sound like I did it, and I, I didn't. I, I wrote a lot of the sections, but it's from talking to the experts that we've got around the state, some folks here like Brian, uh, but many people in the Fish and Wildlife Department who are experts in wildlife. And we've tried to sort of merge the ideas of natural communities 
where we focused on plants in the past, which are how we define them mostly. The plants are static. But if you think about Vermont and it's the natural landscape, you can classify all of it to a natural community type, other than the parts that are heavily altered. And that pattern of natural communities across the state are the wildlife habitats for the state. And some species, like deer, uh, move across the landscape, but then they focus on a place like a hemlock forest for deer wintering areas. So they may be broad in the distribution for parts of their life cycle and narrow in others. And some species are really specific to particular natural community types or particular settings. So it's, it's been a really fun thing to add, and I, I hope folks uh, enjoy it. Here's an uh, uh, elfin skimmer, which is closely associated with peatlands. Uh, here's a, a poor fan. Most of the, I think most of the, these uh, dragonflies that like peatlands like the open water parts that uh, and, uh, but also some are closely associated with sphagnum. Uh, species like this wood turtle that are closely associated not just with alluvial shrub swamps but with riparian areas and uh, sometimes uh, openings in riparian areas where they feed. Uh, cobblestone tiger beetle, surprise, surprise, it likes river, shore cobble shore, river cobble shores. Um, but pretty specific to these kind of open shores. So there are, there are lots of associations like that, and some of them are pretty tight, and some of them are kind of uh, general. Here's one that's more general. Uh, this little gem in the forest uh, likes mixed forest and conifer forests, and often in the top of tall conifers. Um, so it's, it's a more widespread species. Um, that's it. I just wanted to end by um, reading a short section from the book. I can find it. Our vision for the future. Our vision for Vermont's future is of a place where humans and nature coexist and both are healthy. 100 years from now and beyond, we envision a Vermont with large areas of contiguous, unfragmented forests with natural lakes, streams, wetlands, cliffs, and ridge tops. We envision these communities providing habitat for all the species that naturally occur here. We envision riparian and upland habitat corridors connecting these large areas of contiguous forests allowing unhindered movement of animals and plants. We envision a Vermont where both humans and nature are resilient. Even as unprecedented climate change stresses, stresses our world, we envision ecosystems still shaped by natural processes such as species migration, adaptation and selection, and natural disturbances. We see possibilities of new communities unknown to any biologist today, where innumerable plants and animals continue to live, reproduce, and thrive. Key to realizing this vision is a renewed and strengthened human commitment to the natural world. We envision a system of conserved lands that encompasses the full array of Vermont's physical features, from lowland swamps to alpine peaks, supporting multiple viable examples of all Vermont's natural communities. We also envision private and public landowners practicing thoughtful and thoughtful stewardship and sustainable management of Vermont's forests and other lands to provide timber, food, water, and other natural resources that we need. We envision Vermonters living in harmony with the natural world and enjoying its bounty well into the future. We hope that others share this vision and that this book will help us all achieve it. Thanks very much. And I think, are there still books to sell? Is there some books to sell too? And we, we can stick around and sign up if you want to. So, any questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned oak. Uh, yeah. There's uh, red oak, white oak, burr oak. And you mentioned yellow oak, which I'm not aware of. Where do they grow in Vermont? Where is there, uh, where do they have to be? 
found, readily found in Vermont. Uh, yellow, oak, yellow oak is one that is in those, those places that Liz described mostly. Um, limestone cedar bluff forests and those dry, warm, uh, shallow bedrock calcareous areas right behind me. So, uh, Are dry they, bedrock settings. Is it yellow? It's, uh, I don't know why they call it yellow. Do you know this? I don't either. Does anybody else know why they call it yellow? And do they get to be large? Yeah. 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 yeah, I think ours here probably under as big as where they are in the main part of the range, but they're, they're good size trees. And each of the oaks has a really different pattern, you know, bur oak and swamp white oak and red oak and black oak and white oak. And the, the, the colors might refer to the, the, to the wood. The, the red oak. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you given any thought to which communities would be most affected by die-off of ash when that happens? Yes, and, and, and the state's kind of working on some of that, too. I mean, uh, forests and parks and fish and wildlife are working on what we do on state lands for these things, too. Uh, the ones that we think are most likely to be affected are the forest and wetlands. Um, there's evidence now from uh, Minnesota, uh, Tony DeMato, that's a professor at UVM, worked out there, too. But there's evidence that especially those forested wetlands that are heavily dominated by ash, if the ash are all killed, it changes the evapotranspiration in the swamp. And you can end up going from a forested system to a system that's really marshy because the water isn't removed. Um, and other communities, like Richland and Harvard Forest, I think we kind of expect other trees to just kind of fill in. Anything else? I just, well, just one thing else about that, about ash and emerald ash borer, is, is we're trying to, we collectively, uh, uh, conservation people are trying to really encourage people to um, see, see hope uh, for ash in the future and to act as if there's hope. In other words, to not cut down all your ash, but instead to manage for ash and, and keep your eye out for um, resistant trees, particularly, as Eric said, white, white ash, which there seems to be some resistance. Okay. There's still some uncertainty, too, where there's little spots, like that place where I've got that big ash, big uh, black ash, where there's some spots that we kind of jumped over. One ash tree, like they, they, they zoom in on a smell or a chemical that tells them where it is, so maybe they'll miss something. John, could you say a little bit something about what you've added for <laughs> That's a hard question. Yeah. I think there's there's two there's two parts to it. Uh, one is we've tried to in the introductory sections to really talk about what conservation means in a time of climate change when the natural communities that are described in this book uh, are probably not going to be static when we start thinking about the next I don't know century, hopefully at least that long. But at some point, they'll change and species will move around. And so what does it mean to conserve when things are changing? So that's one thing that we've tried to touch upon. And there's no easy answer, so I won't even attempt to, to explain it here. But there's hope that by conserving natural communities now, we'll maintain the uh, stage for biological diversity into the future. Uh, and then in each of the community profiles, we have revisited the conservation and management recommendations. Uh, trying to use our collective experience and what we've learned from others to describe how we best uh, maintain the particular drivers and qualities of each of those particular communities. I, I just wanted to add, so to reiterate one thing that Bob said, that it's really important. Like we talk about communities changing with, with climate, and we, we go out and find best examples now and say this is a place that needs to be conserved. And if that place changes and isn't that community in the future, does that mean it's not worthwhile anymore? And I, I think the point is that if we find these cool places now, they're there because of that physical setting. And something different will be there, but it's likely to be something equally important because it's going to reflect what's at that, that physical setting. Even in these pictures, the top of Camel's Hump is always going to have something interesting and unusual in Vermont, regardless of, of how vegetation changes. <laughs> so back on the ash, kind of a crazy question I have. But if we cut along the right of way of town highways and 
things like that and leave a buffer strip to other apps? Do you think that helps? Or, you know, just, Thanks. I, I've read, I think, where ash if there was left alone would only travel a mile right. a year or something like that. And the, the in, you know, importing it is what's spreading. Right. I, I, I don't think I have a good answer for that. I, there are some recommendations coming out uh, for, um, for landowners from uh, forest and parks and I think most of it is what Liz said is don't take it all plan for the future that some of it might survive and that we don't know all that's going on so if you've got a sick tree shake it the stuff near the road is really important because once ash dies it's a really dangerous tree to cut it, it tends to fracture and break and I think there's a, a really important safety issue 